It's a part of the mind that's just aware. No matter what else comes into the mind, whether it's greed, anger, delusion, despair, depression, regret, fear, that's just part of the mind. There's also another part that's just aware of these things. It tends to get blocked out when strong emotions come into the mind. But still, it's always there. That's the part of the mind that the hum on the refrigerator is always there in the background. Or maybe a better analogy would be the, the hum of the Big Bang that's still detectable all the time. And one of the tricks of the meditation is learning to get in touch with that. Not to regard it as an unusual state of mind, but have it as the background state of mind. It's kind of a shift of your center of gravity. Because for the most part, we tend to live in our emotions. We live in our creations, the little worlds we create for ourselves. And as the Buddha pointed out, there's a lot of suffering there. All these worlds require effort to keep them going. They have to feed off of something. When the Buddha says that becoming is conditioned by clinging, the word clinging can also mean feeding or the act of taking sustenance. And the sustenance is the, the passion of the desire. So once there's the desire, we get into it, take it as far as we can go. There's always a kind of an act of feeding going on. And that's stressful. So what we've got to learn how to do is get out of those little worlds that we could create for ourselves, because otherwise you can create huge emotional storms that can blow you away. People talk about sitting and meditating and being blown away by their emotions to the point where they can't even sit anymore. Well, if you actually look at the, the wind from the outside, there's no wind blowing, push, you know, blowing them off the seat. But it's these storms that get blown up in the mind, and they put themselves in the storms. And of course they're going to get blown around. But it's always important to remember that the, there's an awareness that surrounds the storms. And if you can place your center of gravity in the awareness around the storms, then you don't get blown away. And it's not that difficult to get out of the storms. You can observe them as they're happening. The trick is getting changing your center of gravity and keeping it changed. And one of the problems is the impatience that blows up as a separate storm. You get impatient. When are these storms going to go away? And then you get placing yourself, excuse me, instead of getting you place yourself in that second storm, the impatient storm. And that can blow you away as well. Or the boredom. A lot of these secondary storms are the ones that hit a lot of meditators. So you have to watch out for them. You have to realize there's a space around those storms as well, too. You have to learn how to watch those from the outside. So much of the commentary going on in the mind is just this sort of thing. You pull yourself out of the storms that have to do with events from the past or events in the future. But then you let yourself get wound up in storms of the present. So when these things come up, whether they're regret or impatience or whatever, just watch them too. And they may seem awfully powerful and awfully real, but 
one of the tricks is to question the reality. But the second was simply realize, okay, there is a reality to these things, but it's created, it's false, it's artificial. That's something you're doing right now. Then you may not even be aware of what you're doing. Back when I was younger, I used to like to write, write fiction. And basically what a fiction writer does is he, he or she gets into a little mental world. And the more real you can make that world to yourself, the better the story And when it comes out. And one of the things I notice is sometimes you create a character and the character surprises you. The more real the character becomes in your mind, the more it can start doing unexpected things. And when that happens, then you start thinking, well, maybe this is really an independent character. But it's actually part, it's a figment of your own imagination. And the reason that these characters can surprise you is the same reason why you get surprised by things that come into the mind in normal world-creating activities or world-creating thoughts. In other words, we're so oblivious to what we're doing that it can actually surprise us. And that's when these thoughts begin to seem very real and have an independent existence. What simply happened is that the part of your mind is creating them is behind a wall from the other part, the part that's watching them. That's why they can take unexpected turns. This is why we have to get the mind really, really quiet so we can get closer and closer to that part of the mind that just observes. And also so we can get clear about where these fabrications are coming from. Because when you get to the point where they offer no surprise, that's when you start getting disenchanted with them. You see them for all their artificiality. And that's when you begin to be able to pull yourself out more and more consistently. So whatever storms come brewing up in the mind, remember it's just an event in your awareness. And there's an awareness that surrounds these things. And you want to learn how to give more reality to that awareness give more weight to that awareness than you do to the storms. If you're going to identify with anything, and it's natural that we do identify with things all along the path, learn how to identify with that very still awareness. It may not seem very bright, very intelligent, very creative, but it's your salvation. It's what you can hold on to that's going to keep you from getting blown away. How many times have you seen people who are really very clever, very imaginative, and very creative? And then something takes on an independent life in their mind, and they can kind of actually killing themselves. Simply because of these thought creations. They can feel themselves pushed into all sorts of weird and self-destructive directions. Simply because they can't let go of particular worlds of thought in their minds. So for the survival of all that's good and worthwhile in your own mind. You've got to learn how to step out of these things. And realize that all of that simple awareness may not seem bright or clever. It's your real friend. And then there is a kind of wisdom that comes in learning how to stay there and just watch, 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 watch. 
not be impatient to get results, not be impatient to see how things turn out. To learn how to watch and be more and more stable. Because it's the stability that's going to allow you to see very subtle things. To see the tricks that the mind plays on itself, the places where it pulls the curtain down, or it throws up walls. to maintain its illusions. And it's your steady gaze that's going to enable you to see through those illusions. And at the beginning of the meditation, that basic watcher, the observer, may seem as unstable and as fragile as any of the other worlds you might create. But as you get more and more used to placing your center of gravity here, you find that it's a lot easier than a lot of those other worlds. It too is a kind of world. There comes a point where you have to take this apart too. But this is the more stable one. And you find over time that your center of gravity can begin to shift in this direction. And once it's here, then the qualities of stability and patience and endurance come a lot easier. And you come to value them more and more. And although they themselves may not seem all that surprising, they do allow you to find out some very surprising things about the mind. Particularly, you learn how to see through this process of creation. Where do these worlds come from? I mean, this is how the Buddha discovered dependent core arising. Just watching very patiently. Putting himself in a position where he didn't get blown away. like really good historians or scholars. Everyone wants to sort of get in on the dialogue of common assumptions and show that, yes, they can, they can engage in that dialogue as well. It's the people who say, well, stop, wait a minute, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Something's wrong here. And you step back to get out of a particular dialogue. That's when you begin to see it for what it is. The same thing that goes on in the mind. There's all these little signals and signs that the mind sends to itself, and it feels clever to, in order to say, yes, I understand that signal, I understand that sign, I'll play along with that. And then you get sucked into the particular world of those signals and signs. And John Sawat once said that one of his greatest insights in meditation was he saw how the mind liked to play make-believe with itself. You would have these little agreements. Well, this is this, and that's that, and all of a sudden you've got this whole world of becoming. Just because you thought you were clever that you could interpret the signs. So sometimes it's good to play dumb. Say, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. And step back. And that right there is a lot of the practice.